Join me as I take tech on the road, explore a travel destination, and test out the equipment in real world conditions. This is Field Tested. Hey folks and welcome to Field Tested. Now Field Tested is normally a series where I take a piece of equipment on a dedicated trip for say two weeks or a month, put it through its paces in the real world in different environments, different climates, and see what issues and quirks arise. This one's going to be a little bit different. I've actually been shooting with the Z9 for six months now in over a dozen countries in four different continents, way over 100,000 images and hundreds of hours of high-res video recorded. I can tell you it's an absolute beast, but it's not perfect. Let's jump in. Now let's do this roughly chronologically. I was fortunate to get a pair of these. I purchased them when I was in Australia on Christmas Eve and put them through their paces. Now they're incredibly complex machines. Fortunately, I had had several days shooting with pre-production models, testing them with Nikon before it was actually released. Uh, shooting dances, sports, all kinds of moving subjects, so I am fairly well across it. Still, getting the most out of them takes time to configure because it is so customizable. It's actually the impetus for why I made the complete expert setup guide for Nikon Z cameras. It covers the Z9, but the entire range, you can see details of that one below. It's a living course that keeps getting updated as new features are added. Now, I, after Christmas, I went up to Brisbane in Australia, a subtropical area. I was shooting models on location in a humid river area. And I have to say, the 8K video capability blew me away. It's so helpful when you're filming alone. I'm able to frame up wider, know that wherever I go in the frame, that autofocus is going to stay with me. And then I can still get 4K crops basically anywhere. I was able to get those, still better to have a videographer, but I was able to make those shoots work with just me, a couple of tripods and a couple of different cameras. I was really thrilled with the output of the shots as well. Overall, nothing to complain about. I also had the opportunity to shoot loads of different kinds of wildlife in Australia. It was performing just great. One thing that I did notice, and I also found this early on with birds, if the focus was beyond the animal, and so then they're completely blurred out, often the eye detect wouldn't find them. I needed to manually adjust the autofocus to bring it back to about having them in focus, then it grabbed them. And then once it had them, it stuck with them amazingly well. Now this is something that has largely been fixed up by version 2.0 firmware. I'm gonna talk about that a little later. Next up, I headed over to Thailand for a couple of weeks. I was shooting around the beach and then also in Bangkok incredibly humid on location in hotels you know it's total overkill to be honest in those kind of situations the camera handles everything that i was throwing at it including doing back-to-back -back hours long 8k and 4k 120 files it's honestly quite amazing that a camera this size i mean for a lot of mirrorless users this is big and heavy but for videographers this is relatively small to be able to do 8k and not have the camera constantly overheating or even at all even when you're in blistering temperatures tropical climates in the sun it's incredible the only issue we've really had with overheating is cards overheating and only once I think a card actually overheating to the point we needed to stop. Otherwise it's just been kind of overheating warning that it's getting hot, but it hasn't actually interrupted our productions. Now, if you saw, I did a video on 10 things I didn't love about the Z9. It wasn't just clickbait. The main one I think in my mind is how they've redesigned these port covers. So many cameras, even the new Fuji X2H whatever, has four port covers, one for every single port. The old D5, D6 had four port covers. This guy now only has two. So by having my HDMI in use, I have to expose my USB-C. And if say I wanted to plug in a microphone, then I have to have my freaking ethernet port 
exposed as well. I'm currently shooting in the rain. That's really not ideal. There should be a port cover for every door on a pro camera, in my opinion. Now, if you don't mind, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the build quality of this guy. I find it may be the biggest jump over the Z6 II and the Z7 II. It's long been the case that only the integrated grip flagships like the D5 and D6 had a locking card door and the D850 and that kind of thing didn't. Hey, yeah, the locking card door's just here. Um, but it's more pronounced on these guys. The lock is actually overprotected in my opinion now. There's no chance you'll bump it open. Whereas I think the door on the Z7 II is easy to bump open and actually a risk. I've had the chance to shoot with this in tropical climates, in the cold, in the rain, in the snow, in all kinds of, with crazy birds. Um, and I have no hesitation about the build quality of this and I love that it has the sensor cover. There's probably only two exceptions where I'm not 100% sure on the build quality. One is the rear screen. Now don't get me wrong, I love, are you gonna bite me or jump on me? just gonna scare the shit out of me. That was loud. What's up? I don't have food, but if you wanna jump on me, you're welcome. Just please don't bite me. Up oh, and it bit me. Uh, this is your corner, I guess. Let's try it again. Don't get me wrong, I do love the screen. I'm all for it. I prefer this over the fixed one, but you can't deny, you can't deny it. I don't care how loud you yell, that this is a potential weak point compared to a fixed screen. If you were to catch that on something and give it a good jank, you could potentially rip it off. The ribbon is really thin. Having said that, I'm the clumsiest guy in the business and I haven't damaged it after six months, so I don't think it's a real concern. Quick word from this video's sponsors, folks. KEH Camera have been partners of the channel for years. They've been in the business since 1979. They have the world's biggest range of used equipment with over 60,000 items in stock and thousands of them come with a 180 day warranty. But every piece has been tested, checked and cleaned so you know exactly what you're getting. It's kind of thanks to them that I'm shooting with the Z9 now because about two, two years ago or so, I sold my DSLR equipment to them in one big transaction to save me having to find buyers individually for everything and made the move to mirrorless. Check out the details in the description below. You can get a bonus 5% when you're buying from them or a bonus 5% if you're selling some of your unneeded gear to them to refinance, maybe to move into mirrorless for yourself. Full details are in the description below. I recently headed over to the States and Iceland for about five weeks. In America, I was spending a lot of my time down in Philly, shooting and hanging out with Steph, putting the Z9 through his paces there and on the streets in New York City. And in Iceland, the team and I took the pair of Z9s all around the country, racking up thousands of miles. We shot 12 hour days shooting for a bunch of different upcoming series, including wildlife photography, but also some art new bodyscapes in public. Talking about firmware version 2.0, you could almost do a field tested review just on that update. It was seriously huge. I had my doubts when they said this was going to be updated to do 8K internal, but they did it. This is now doing, with the firmware update, 8.3K 60P raw internal to the cards. I've done a dedicated video on this. There's actually a whole bunch of different upgrades. For video, you also have new display options. For stills, we've got pre-release capture up to 120 shots, customizable focus area modes, 120 frame per second viewfinder refresh rate, in-camera motion blur, and more. I'll pop a link to that one below. I've already updated my Nikon Z setup guide to go through all of those new features and how to get the most out of them. Details on that are below as well. Now, in terms of image quality, in my opinion, having shot over 100,000 files with these guys over the last six months, I think it's as good as any high-res camera 
Nikon has ever made. And that's saying something because they really are class leaders in terms of image quality. Generally, with a stack sensor, you might expect it to be behind a little bit, so similar resolution to the DA50, but I don't find that to be the case. There's slight variations, but it's really right up there. But I want you to be able to make up your own mind, so I'm going to give you a link to a zip file with heaps of sample files that you can use for your own purposes. Just below, you can download them over at learn.artnewportraiture.com. No charge. Now, in terms of the lens range, I have to say this is something that Sony got a lot of flack for when they were industry leaders bringing out the full frame mirrorless cameras. It just takes time to build that out. Sony now has an incredibly built out range and Nikon is getting started. Now, it's easy when something comes out that you want, you buy it, you're excited, that's just it. And when what you're waiting for isn't coming out, you focus on it, you fixate on it, and you kind of get frustrated that it's not coming. For me as a portrait photographer, I would really like to see a faster 85 mil come out and a fast 105. Now, I don't think the 105 is even on the roadmap. So there's still gaps in the range. They're getting more and more uh, long tele lenses, zooms and primes, which if you're using them, that's fantastic. One thing I have to say though, the FTC Mark II adapter for this camera, it's really exceptional. With almost all of the F-mount lenses that I've shot with, they're completely usable, and in some cases, even faster than they were on a D6. My 200mm F2, for example, which is unbelievable on F-mount, is even better on the Z-mount. One thing I think they desperately need to do, though, is bring out an FTC adapter with a built-in autofocus motor so people using the older lenses that don't have that AF motor can still make use of them on this monster camera. Now, something that dominated the press when this was first out was about card speed and buffering. And I did a bunch of tests on this. Essentially, you're going to need the fastest cards available if you want to be able to get the most out of this camera. Any system, camera, computer, whatever, is only as fast as the slowest component in the system. And if you're using slow cards, that's going to be the slowest. Being able to do 20, 30, 120 frames a second, high res files, it just means there's a whole lot of data being pushed around. And it stands to reason, it wasn't that long ago that companies always split it. You had the high-res, slower camera, like a D850 or a 5DSR, and then you had the lower-res sports camera that was really fast, like a 1DX or a D6. It wasn't until arguably the Sony A1 that high-res and high frames per second came together. Now, fortunately, this is using the faster card format, CF Express Type B, compared to the Sony A1. It's using the Type A, which is half the size and half the speed. I've done a guide where I go through and test dozens of different cards and show you the real world performance on them. That's free, you can check it out, the link in the description below. But essentially, you're going to want the fastest cards possible. Having said that, a lot of what I shoot, you know, probably 90% of the time of my shooting is portraiture. And probably more than half of the frames I take, but only 10% of the time, is birds and wildlife and sports. So for that 10%, having the frames per second is important to me. For the 90% though, to be honest, something like the rumored Z8 that would be same sensor, same focus system, same processor, but only a single grip camera with let's say four or five or six frames a second, that would absolutely do it for me. But I would still keep one of these in my bag for those moments where I do want the speed and the resolution. So look folks, in summary, it's not perfect. There are little bugbears, but it's an epic camera. And since it was released, it's won just about every award that the imaging industry has to offer. 
it really is easy to see why. It's such a leap forward over the Z6 and Z7. It's almost like a different species. It's so far ahead. And if you took brand loyalty and investment bias and all of that out of it, I do think it's the best performing mirrorless camera on the market as I record this today. Having said that, if you're a devout Canon or Sony shooter, I don't think that there's necessarily anything here that would bring you across to a new system. Unless you want the 8K internal or the 4K 120 with you know, hours long recording without it overheating, there isn't much of an alternative to this, but it's a leapfrog game. I do think Nikon has surpassed the competition as of today, but no doubt, Canon will bring out something that will leapfrog this, and then Sony will bring out something that leapfrogs that, and a couple of years later, probably, because Nikon's tends to be a little slower, they'll leapfrog them again. But as of today, it's a truly epic camera. There's so much we haven't even touched on this, but it's getting to be a long video, doesn't have a mechanical shutter, has a really great sensor guard, wish they would fix the port covers, or would have given four instead of two, so every port had one, so even five would have been great. But overall, for what I do, it's just a phenomenal camera. Do check out the Nikon Z setup guide in the description below. You can also check out KH and get that 5% off on the buy or sell side. If you're waiting on one of these, I appreciate your frustration and it may be actually the biggest bugbear of the system right now is the wait list. There's people who've been wanting one for four or six months and still haven't got one, and a lot of the hottest lenses are back ordered. My advice to those people who are frustrated, if you haven't already, if this suits your needs, suits your budget, put your order in today. You can't complain about not winning the lottery if you haven't bought a ticket. Putting your name down means that you're at least in the running so that when one becomes available, you're able to pick it up. I personally think that this is actually underpriced. That sounds like such a fanboy thing to say, but looking back at what a D3S, D4, D5, D6 cost, and what this is costing in 2022, I think they could be charging seven, seven and a half thousand dollars for this and it would still be back ordered. 5,500 is a bargain. Love to hear your thoughts. Are you using one? Have you got an order in for one? What do you think about the specs proposition and how it compares to the competition? Leave me a comment and I'll see you soon. 200. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Glad I signed on the pip.